So today, you guys, we wanted to give you a look at the critters that we see pretty commonly in our mangrove and seagrass ecosystems. One of our most favorite trips is to go snorkel in the mangroves and seagrasses. Most people don't realize how many of these guys are what we call inshore invertebrates or our mangrove seagrass critters. These guys were collected yesterday. Marine Lab has a special permit to be able to collect critters and show them off for educational purposes. So that's where all of these guys came from. As we go along, our virtual site where these materials are found is linked on our Facebook page in our previous post. So you should be able to find it on there. But let's get started. So if you're unfamiliar with Marine Lab, we are in Key Largo, Florida. And that's the first island when you come into the Keys. And we're surrounded by mangroves on our shorelines and seagrasses in our um, shallower waters around here. There's a giant seagrass bed surrounding the Florida Keys. So all of these critters you're about to see come from the mangroves and the seagrasses. So what I'm gonna kind of do is introduce you to each animal. As you go along, you'll learn a little bit about them, maybe a little bit about their anatomy and some cool things that we think are really special about them. And then we'll kind of talk a little bit later about the phyla, their groups that they belong to, some similar characteristics, and go from there. So let's get started. All right, so what I have in front of me right here, hi from Knoxville, hi Courtney. What I have here in front of you is a large, one of the larger critters that we have for the day. I want to start with this guy because he actually has a smaller animal on his back. I don't know if you can see, it's kind of dark, but any guesses on what animal this is? If you maybe know the general category, you can shout that out in the comments or maybe you know the specific species of this animal. We see them a lot crawling around in our seagrass beds. I found this guy specifically in a seagrass bed. I didn't think I was going to find one of these. I was snorkeling all over the place and I finally found one and he's pretty big. This is a snail. This is a tulip snail. So let's figure out why we call this guy a tulip snail. I don't know if it's going to work, but if I flip him over, you're going to see the inside of what's called their muscular foot. And that is their big soft part of their body that they use to crawl around, look for food, stick to surfaces. If I flip him over, you're going to see the inside. He doesn't want to move from this wall, but we'll see if we can get him. Inside is kind of a pinkish color. Oh, he was pretty quick to close. But the inside of his muscular foot is really bright pink, so that's why they get their name Tulip Snail. And, oh, can you see the little guy crawling on his back? He's got a little backpack, buddy. That is another little snail. I believe it's a tegula snail, but there are so many snails out there. Sometimes it is hard to ID them. Now what you're looking at is the underside of this tulip snail. This would normally be on his bottom. And there's this hard plate that you kind of see right here. That is called an operculum. The operculum protects the rest of its soft body when it tucks all the way inside of its shell. And so that it's nice and safe and not vulnerable to predators. Now you can see its soft body coming out. It doesn't want to sit on its back like that. So it's going to crawl and pull itself right side up using its muscular foot. Tulip snails are pretty active. This guy is one of the more slower tulip snails I've seen. Maybe we just woke him up from a nap. But see, he's coming out. You can kind of see that pink coloration on the inside. Oh, now you can see it pretty well. That is its muscular foot and you can see how it's kind of sparkly like a 
galaxy in the sky. He's reaching, reaching for the ground, using that muscular foot to pull his body right side up. That's the way he wants to be. Look at that. See, they're pretty cool. He wants to be right side up so his mouth, which is connected to its muscular foot, is on the bottom so he can search for food. You can see the two little antenna is coming out of his head. Those are sensory organelles. They're used for kind of seeing what's going on out there. You can also see the proboscis, which is this tube-like structure. It is part of his soft body coming out and sensing the environment, trying to figure out if there's predators or prey close by. Because he's hungry. He wants some food. Now, tulip snails, you guys, I have a question for you. Told you a little bit about them. What do you think? Are tulip snails carnivorous or herbivorous? The other option is omnivorous. If you're unsure of what those mean, carnivorous is that they eat other animals. Herbivorous is that they only eat plants and omnivorous is that they eat both animals and plants. We got an escape artist over here. So their snails really, oh, he decided not to escape. What about those tulip snails? Carnivorous, herbivorous, or both? Making them omnivorous. I don't remember specifically if I've seen them eating other tulip snails, but um, I almost think I did see a bigger tulip snail eating a smaller tulip snail. So they do sometimes eat other small snails that happen to be the same species. <laughs> and that answers that question. They are carnivorous because they do eat other snails. A lot of you guys are saying, saying herbivorous or omnivores, herbivores. Um, a lot of other species of snails are herbivorous or um, omnivorous, so you're not wrong. This is just this specific species. I have another little snail over here. This is a serith snail. These guys hang out on the seagrass blades. A lot of the times we see them there, they suction themselves with that muscular foot to the seagrass blades. They're pretty small. But these tulip snails get about to be this big, maybe a little bit bigger. All right, we're gonna move on. Say goodbye to our tulip snail for now. We'll see you later. And we're gonna move on to another animal. Now, you're looking at these three things and you're thinking, hmm, they don't really look like animals. So you guys tell me, what animal are we looking at? They're not moving. I'm telling you, they're alive. I'll give you a big hint in that they have pores that allow water to go in and out so that they can filter feed. They're not very active. They just grow from one spot all day long for their whole entire life. They just grow and grow and grow and replicate cells. Good job, you guys. So these are sponges. Now, sponges I often think are underrated because they're pretty cool. My first experience with a sponge was opening it up and finding an octopus inside of the sponge. Now, it was a lot bigger sponge than these guys. And if you're asking, Rachel, why did you open up that sponge? Sponges are actually capable of growing from smaller pieces of themselves. So you can actually rip them up into pieces and they're still going to be able to grow from that smaller piece. So that's why these guys are here with us right now, because they're just smaller pieces of a larger sponge that was out there. We'll return them and then they'll keep growing and regenerating cells because that's pretty much what they're made of, a bunch of cells that serve different purposes, defending themselves, reproducing, growing, a lot, helping water move through the sponge. 
they are really cool um, micro habitat. Like I said, I found an octopus inside of them one time, but you also find worms and shrimp, what we call amphipods. If you joined in for our rock shake lab, you're familiar with the amphipods. And lots of other little stuff that lives inside in the nice safe home of a sponge. So we've got, most of these are mangrove sponges. This one right here is chicken liver sponge. Kind of a weird name, but if you are here right now, which I wish you all were, and I was teaching you in person to see all of your lovely faces, um, it feels slimy like a chicken liver. It also kind of looks like a chicken liver. All right, so sponges. They have pores, they're filter feeders, and they are pretty crazy. They grow in all different shapes and sizes, and they're often different colors, and that's kind of how we ID them. All right, let's move on to some more active animals. Not super active, but one of Marine Lab's most favorite critter. I'm gonna let you guys guess what these animals are. I'll give you a hint, they're similar to our tulip snail, but they're not exactly the same. They're our most favorite to see, they're very um, common. Now, specifically, these guys are lettuce sea slugs, and the reason they're called lettuce sea slugs is very obvious. They are green and have ruffles that look like lettuce. Now these guys have these ruffles because surprisingly they actually are able to perform photosynthesis. So they need sunlight. So they need lots of surface area. Lots of area to absorb more sunlight. You can see how these guys are opening up those ruffles to get more surface area for more sunlight. And the reason they can perform photosynthesis is actually pretty cool. So they eat algae, and once they eat that algae, they actually can steal the chloroplasts of that algae. Now, if you know anything about a chloroplast, you know those are the organelles responsible for photosynthesis. So because they're able to steal those chloroplasts, they're able to utilize them within their tissues to photosynthesize, using that sunlight to produce nutrients for themselves. A lot of bottom feeders probably eat these guys because sea slugs hang out on the bottom using that muscular foot to kind of suction to the bottom a little bit, stick to it and crawl along. And so then you're probably going to have a lot of your other creatures that live near the bottom eating these guys. The name for that process of being able to steal the chloroplast and photosynthesize is called kleptoplasty. Klepto, because they're stealing, like a kleptomaniac, and plasty because they're stealing those chloroplasts. Aren't they cool, you guys? Come on. What a unique creature. I just love their ruffles and their two little um, antenna-like structures on the top of their head are rhinophores. They're sensory um, parts of their body able to figure out what's going on in the environment next to them. So these guys are similar to snails in that they have a soft squishy body but they're an example that do not have a shell. Okay, Just say goodbye to our sea slugs for now, but we're going to move on to another pretty cool creature. Here is, dun dun dun, you all know it. What is this? He's a cutie. I found him at the last minute on my snorkel. Hey, you guys are getting it! Hermit crab! Good job! So these are pretty common in all parts of the world. Um, a lot of these critters that we're seeing today are common in all parts of the world, but they're just different species. So down here we have a very specific, we have very specific species that only live in this um, 
climate, this subtropical climate, and um, lots and lots of different species of sea slugs, and lots and lots of different species of hermit crabs. Hermit crabs are all over the place, and they have jointed appendages. They have an exoskeleton, just like our regular crabs. They're also related to shrimp, lobsters. They all, all of those guys have what's called an exoskeleton. It's a hard outer shell that they live inside of. And they actually have to molt that off. So they have to kind of shed that exoskeleton when they become too big for it. It becomes too tight, uh, like a tight sweater on Christmas can't keep that tight sweater on for too long so they they shed the outer exoskeleton by crawling out of it and then they create a new one so, and they create that new one a little bit bigger than the old one so that they have room to grow hermit crabs and you guys all know they as they grow bigger they try to find a new shell and the actually cool part is if you ever see them try to find a new shell, you get to see their whole um, body on the inside come out. And they actually have a ridiculously weird body on the inside of their shell. It's longer, they have a longer abdomen, and it's curled so that they can curl their body around the curves of the shell so that they can hug that shell as they walk along. So the, the body of a hermit crab is actually pretty weird. But he's probably not going to uh, exit his shell right now. He, see, he feels pretty safe, so we're going to move on. All right. Another favorite is dun, 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 the sea stars. These guys are pretty cool. And these are our conical spined sea stars. That's the species that we find a lot in our mangroves. And they are surprisingly common down here. If you go snorkeling pretty much anywhere around Key Largo in the mangroves, you're going to see a bunch of these. All right, so our sea stars. I mentioned earlier that these guys are carnivorous. And the coolest thing I like to tell people is that when they eat, their stomach comes out of their mouth, which is located on the underside in the center right here. Their stomach exits the mouth, it comes out, it engulfs its prey, digests the prey in the stomach outside of the body, and then brings its stomach back in to its body. Isn't that nuts, you guys? What a crazy process to eat. So I think of it as if, if it were to happen to us, if we did this, our stomach, we would pull it out of our belly button, we'd wrap it around our pizza, and then we'd push that stomach full of pizza back in through our belly button, and we'd be full. Isn't that crazy? A lot of times I find these sea stars, a bunch of them, all over one sponge because they're probably all feeding on whatever creatures are inside of that sponge. Oh, and as we were talking here, I didn't even realize this sea star just flipped himself over. They have that ability because of their two feet. You can see them coming out here. These two feet have suction cups on the end and they're used to reach for surfaces so that they can cling onto them, stay put, move, whatever they gotta do. These two feet are helping them. Right now you can see some of them are clinging to the side of this little dish here. And this guy, I don't know what he's doing. Usually they feel safe up against the wall here like this guy or on the bottom. This guy is just doing something weird. But like I said before, their mouth is in the center of their body and they actually have an exit um, area to excrete substances and water and nutrients, whatever else, their waste. On the top, there's a madreporite that's an opening. I don't know if it's focused well enough for you guys to see, but there's a really small spot on the top center, right 
there that exits all its waste after it's done eating. And that's called the madrepore, right? They actually have a water vascular system, so the water is what's helping them move around. They're sucking in water and that's what is pushing the tube feet out and retracting the tube feet in so that they can move. This guy's on the move. Uh, how many feet do they have? Tube feet? Tons. Lots and lots of tube feet. You can see just on this one arm, there's like hundreds. So many tube feet. But they need a lot of them to move. This guy's moving, it's really hard to tell, but he is on the move. You can see those two feet sticking out. They're reaching for new surfaces to pull themselves along. And this guy's doing something weird with his legs too. They're pretty crazy, pretty cool. Two feet, water vascular system, they always have five arms. They have what's called pentaradial symmetry, which means they have five equal parts. Oh, and the cool thing. Oh, hi, Allie. Glad you're watching. The cool thing about sea stars and a lot of other creatures that are similar to them is that they can actually regenerate their parts. So if you take, I would never do this, but if you take an uh, arm off or if it loses it from a predator, they can actually regenerate that arm. As long as they have part of their central disc, they are able to regenerate a part of their body. All right, leaving the sea stars for now, moving on to something a little bit similar to a sea star. These guys are super weird, but they're cool to kind of watch their behavior. So what do we think these are? You guys tell me what animal are we looking at? pretty weird looking. There's another one hiding under this. Oh, he's clinging on to it. We'll set it back down. So there's two in here. What are these animals? Brittle star. So these guys are brittle stars. They're similar to sea stars. They're in that same group, that same phylum that has similar characteristics. They have five arms. The difference between these guys is that they have these central, um, not central, but they have these plates all over their body, their arms, and it's making them feel brittle, hence the name. And so if you're touching them, you kind of feel it's a little bit harder. And like if you were to squeeze it a little bit too hard, it would break. So they have those plates connecting all over the outside of their body and they're different from our conical sign sea stars that we were just showing because they can pull their body using their arms. See this guy's using his whole arm to pull his body along. He's not moving too fast. They're pretty slow, but no, he doesn't want to move, but they use their whole arm to pull their body and they really like the dark. So anytime you want to find one of these out in the mangroves or the seagrasses, you're not going to just see them out in the bout. You're going to have to kind of look underneath things. So we tend to pull up big clumps of algae to find them hiding underneath. They're nocturnal, so they like the dark. They're most active at night. So that's why I put this big green thing in there. That's actually sea lettuce algae. And I put it in there so that he could hide under it have a nice safe spot. This guy doesn't want to hide. They're pretty similar. Uh, the central disc on these, this one is a lot bigger than this one, but I do think they are the same species. All right, they're pretty cool. We'll come back to them if you guys want to later, but let's move along. I'm getting a little bit too into each creature here. This one's really cool. Now the green is that same sea lettuce algae, but the creature, as you can see, is that brown tentacle-like creature. What do we think this is? I'll give you a hint. I'll give you two hints. The first one is that it has stinging cells, or the fancy term is nidocytes. And the other hint is that Nemo lives in one of these. I 
Anemone, you guys are getting it. Very good. So this anemone was, I didn't even actually purposely collect this guy, but he was stuck to this sea lettuce algae. So I just accidentally collected him. And he's pretty cool. They have those tentacles. They have a polyp body shape, similar to coral polyps. They have those stinging cells like I talked about before. Now, this guy probably doesn't have extremely painful stinging cells, not super strong. There's a ton of these anemones out in the mangroves. Um, and sometimes I brush up against them, but they don't, they don't feel too painful when I brush up against them. Good job, you guys are getting it. Very smart. Okay, it's got some smaller critters to talk about. This guy, He's pretty unique. I want you to guess. It's always fun seeing what you guys think these are because the first time I saw them, I definitely had some pretty creative guesses. He's not moving too much. Normally they move a little bit more. He's hiding in the He's hiding in the corner. He feels safe there, so I won't bother him too much. But what do we think this is? This is a flatworm. It's a lined flatworm. So we do have worms in our oceans, people. There are worms everywhere. Most of the time you can't see them. They're not out and about, but this is a flatworm. They tend to crawl along the bottom of um, mangroves, hang around the mangrove branches, and they're often found mixed in with what's called a tunicate colony because they eat tunicates. Now, what is a tunicate, Rachel? A tunicate is also called a sea squirt. They're filter feeders. They don't move. They stick to a surface and they bring in water and filter it out. And when you squeeze them, they squirt out water. That's why they're called sea squirts. I'm going to show you an example of a mangrove tunicate in just a second. But these guys, these flatworms, they're pretty cool. All right. Let's go on to a mangrove tunicate. Now the one mangrove tunicate I found today is not one that we see, I mean we do see it very often, but up here in Key Largo we usually see a different species of tunicate. But this guy is a solitary mangrove tunicate. And he has two siphons. Because he's black I can't really point out the specific two holes that the siphons bring uh, push out water but this guy is an example of a tunicate he is one tunicate he is an animal sometimes there's a colony of tunicates and they're bright orange and there's multiple hundreds actually sometimes in one clump of tunicates but they're important to our ecosystem because they are filter feeders and they're actually more complex than you would think oh you can see the siphon on the top right that's the siphon they pull in water and push it out and um, so our tunicates are actually more complex than you would think they are they actually have a circulatory system um, when they were a plankton in their larval form they actually have a backbone they have a backbone because when they're a larval, uh, when they're in their larval state, they move around. They need to be able to move around in the beginning of their life so they can pick the spot that they sit on for the rest of their life. Because these guys don't move once they become an adult form. So in their larval form, they're wiggling around. They kind of look like crazy spastic worms. We'll do our plankton lab at one point during our live lessons and you'll get to see them. But they go crazy, they find a spot to sit. Once they found that spot to sit, they're gonna sit there for the rest of their life. So what they do is they actually eat their backbone. They ingest their own backbone because they're not gonna need it anymore. They're just gonna sit on that same spot for the rest of their life. It would be like if you guys were really crazy as a kid, which I'm sure a lot of you are, your parents are shaking their head yes right now, and all of a sudden you just decided to just sit on the couch for the rest of your life. 
if you decided to sit on the couch for the rest of your life, you wouldn't need your backbone because you wouldn't need any support to hold you up. You'd just be sitting on the couch. If you are like that, you can relate to a tunicate. All right, moving on from the tunicate, I think we have our last, oh, two more creatures. This guy. So, some of you asked if the flatworm was this animal. Now, usually this animal is a lot bigger, but this is a species that stays pretty small. You can see those wiggly things coming out of its head. Those wiggly things coming out of its head are little mouth parts. What do we think this guy is? This creature is a sea cucumber. So I was saying earlier, these guys are sticky sea cucumbers. They're much, much smaller than your normal common sea cucumber that you think about. But there's tons of them out there. They're usually in algae clumps and they're sticking to it. Just using those mouth parts, those little wiggly parts that you see. I'm gonna see if I can get a better view. You can see the mouth parts coming out. They might not be out right now. Those are used to search for food and gather that so they can feed their mouth at the top of their head. Okay, we're gonna move on because I got a cool critter for you. This is everyone's either favorite thing at Marine Lab or their nemesis. I want you guys to tell me what is it? Upside down jellyfish or Cassiopeia. So these guys are weird because they're upside down. They're also weird because when you think of a jellyfish, you think of painful stinging. Now, these guys don't have super strong stinging cells and they don't sting when you touch them. They actually sting through mucus that they secrete when they're disturbed. And that mucus, those stinging cells inside that mucus, isn't, they aren't too painful, like um, maybe if you've ever been stung by a man or it's definitely not that painful. And it's not as painful as a moon jelly either if you've ever been stung by that one, but a lot of times if you swim through those stinging cells in the mucus, it gets itchy, just feels a little tingly, so they're not too strong. Some people react differently. So you can see they have tentacles coming out of their body. This is a medusa body shape. They are, they are related to coral polyps and anemones, so those guys had polyp body shapes. But this guy has a medusa body shape. It's bell, what a lot of people like to talk about um, on jellyfish, the part that usually doesn't sting. If you're thinking Finding Nemo, when they had to bounce through the jellyfish field, they bounced on the top, the non-stinging part. The bell is actually underneath. Can't quite see it, but you can see it on this guy a little better. It's pulsing, it's moving in and out, moving that water around. So these guys are upside down because they need to expose their tentacles to the sunlight, their arms to the sunlight. And that's because they have the same algae that lives inside coral polyps and that's photosynthesizing for them. So they're able to get energy from that relationship. Cassiopeia have what's called zooxanthellae inside of them. That zooxanthellae is that algae that's able to photosynthesize and share nutrients with the Cassiopeia. All right, you guys, so we talked a lot about critters from the mangroves and the seagrasses. And maybe as you are going along, you notice some of them have similar features, similar characteristics. And scientists have noticed that as well. So what they've done is created a classification system and put each animal that has similar characteristics into what's called a phylum. 
Now, if you gathered the materials ahead of time, you might have this sheet. This sheet is explaining all of the different phyla that we find down here in the Florida Keys. And under each phylum, there's a list of characteristics that the animal has that puts them in that phyla or in that group. So they're just like a group of things, group of animals that have similar features or characteristics. On your worksheet, if you have it, I want you guys to kind of put the animals that we saw today in the correct phylum. So based off of what you learned and what you've seen the animals have, see if you can put them in the phylum that they belong to. And we're back. Okay, so as far as the different phyla go, we have Periphera, Arthropoda, Annelida, Nidaria, Echinodermata, Chordata, and Mollusca. Sounds like a lot, but if you're in for the challenge, um, and if you spend some time thought, thinking about it, Periphera are all sponges. So all those different sponges that we saw from the mangroves in our lesson today are all Periphera. They have pores. Arthropoda are any animals that have jointed appendages or exoskeletons and most have compound eyes. Um, so things like crabs, shrimp, lobsters, um, all of those guys. Jointed appendages, bendable arms and legs are arthropods. Annelida are worms. Now, we didn't have any segmented worms in this lesson today, but I want you to know that those are things like bristle worms, um, earthworms, things like that. We did have a worm that's not listed on this phylum list, and it is uh, platyhelminthes. That's a flatworm. You can look that up. It starts with a P. Then we have Nidaria. So we had two animals today in Nidaria. Those guys have stingy cells, polyp or medusa body shape, and tentacles. So those guys were your Cassiopeia and your anemone. Echinodermata, those guys have spiny skin. Spiny skin, five equal parts pentaradial symmetry. So your sea stars, your brittle stars, your sea cucumber, that's it. We didn't have any urchins. I couldn't find them. Uh, Chordata, those are the ones that have backbone. So I'm trying to think of what we have. Oh, tunicates are in subphylum Eurochordata, so they are somewhat considered a chordate because they start with the backbone, but then you know what happens after. Um, then our last phylum was Mollusca, so those guys are the ones that have soft, squishy body and soft mesh, so your seed is to list animals you think you find in the mangroves and sea grasses. This is just where your creativity comes in. You can see a lot of different things. A whole new diversity of things in the mangroves and sea grasses. So use your imagination. Um, I really hope you guys enjoyed your lesson today and stay tuned for more every week we're going to be posting more. Um, Follow us on Facebook if you have it, and you'll be notified of the new things that are coming up. And um, tune into 